Okay, good morning everyone. Thanks very much for coming along. Uh, it is a great pleasure to have uh, our speaker today at the CC Seminar Series, uh, Kylie Eilman. Uh, I asked Kylie to introduce herself. So she will do the, the hard part uh, of, this, uh, of this seminar. And uh, we have uh, up to five people on Zoom. Uh, good morning, everyone on Zoom. Uh, this lecture is recorded and it may go live on an uh, open plant pathology uh, YouTube channel. So over to, yeah, to you, Kai. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me, Levy. It's um, really great to be here. Levy said to give you a bit of my background. Um, and We'll get to why we know each other as well, which is nice. So I guess I'm a plant pathologist by training. Um, I actually went through UQ, so I'm a Queensland girl from way back. Um, and then I actually moved to WA to Murdoch University and did my PhD in plant biosecurity. I worked on sudden oak death or Phytophthora remorum, um, which we don't have in Australia and hopefully we never have in Australia, knocking all sorts of wood. Um, and I was never a big molecular plant pathologist. Plant pathology has gone very molecular um, in the last few years, but what I did with a bit of field work and post range testing, as well as I've got the image there, I did what's called Climax modeling. So um, Climax, which is like a climate suitability modeling program, um, as well as spending time in the lab. And my undergrad, I did arts as well. So actually my PhD thesis, I did science into policy and management as well. So trying to look at, we do all this research, how do we get it into things? And some note get, um, which is a very political pathogen, had a really cool look at that. Um, and one of the key takeaways for me is that relationships matter. So somewhere like Oregon, where they're managing that pest really well, you've got whole groups of people who've come through the same PhD lab and then end up in government. And it makes that connection to getting information flow much easier. Um, and then other places like the UK actually have better structures at a kind of higher level governmentally and stuff like that. Um, and then I went and worked on Myrtle Rust shortly after that, which is where I know Ahmed from. So that was a nice little surprise. Ahmed used to work in the lab with me. Um, he was very great help at the time. Uh, and then following that, as many of you will know, sometimes it's hard to secure that that job, the job, you know. Um, and I had the opportunity to be an Australian volunteer um, overseas. So linked in with the Crawford Fund, working in Paxe in Southern Laos. Um, and that's the picture here on, at the top there. That's um, Professor Lester Burgess. If any of you have come across him, you do not forget him. He's got lots of energy, more than I do. And he's well into his eighties, I think now. But it was such an incredible experience. If you ever get the opportunity you know, you just have to jump both feet in. It's like opening a second year plant pathology textbook when you go there. It's just lots of classic plant diseases um, and working across those linguistic boundaries and cultural boundaries and looking at different ways to manage pests. So I'm a very um, tactile kind of learner, tactile person, so that was really great. But linked in with a lot of, through Leicester especially, you know, we sent a lot of cultures down to the culture collection in New Zealand the ICMP with Bevan Weir. We had experts in um, Phytophthora and Pythium come over, experts in Fusarium come over and run all these workshops um, to get cultures into scientific collections, as well as to teach the staff how to um, diagnose diseases and then manage them into the field. Uh, from there, I went and did a, two postdocs. So they one ran into the other at CSIRO in Canberra. Um, Canberra's not that bad if you're ever looking at a job there. I can highly recommend it. And certainly if you're more of a molecular plant pathologist, that's where they're concentrating a lot of their plant pathology and molecular plant pathology these days. Um, but I worked in more of a plant biosecurity kind of risk modelling project and then a pro projects that I loved um, working on biocontrol. And often in biocontrol you get to work with um, rusts and things like that and actually just getting to work with um, those biotrophs that if you love them and you hate them and I know that Levy knows that well as well trying to keep your babies alive um, but it, yeah again it's that amazing amount of being able to go and do field work so this is me doing field work on African boxthorn 
to collect cultures um, and labs, and then also working in the lab in, uh, I think it's pretty much one of the only purpose-built kind of facilities like it is, is there's a BC3 in Canberra. So you can actually work on plant pathogens um, in a growth, growth chamber kind of thing. So again, similar to what you've got with the negative pressure here in that facility. So really interesting stuff. And then I ran into Levy doing this project. So um, I'm not too shy, I love to talk. <laughs> um, and so I became an extension coordinator um, for the Australian Fungicide Resistance Extension Network. And so bringing together plant pathologists from all across Australia to get the knowledge into one place and deliver that to Australian grain growers. Um, and that was really, really interesting, really dynamic. Um, I never thought I'd find fungicide resistance that interesting, um, but pathogens can continue to evolve, they continue to shift and shape to what we do. So um, that was a lot of project management and keeping in mind as you're going through your degrees and that, that you're learning a lot of what we call more soft skills and don't underestimate or don't undervalue them. Um, soft skills or the project management you do do. Um, and yeah, I've got my sister here today, but our other sister as well has done her PhD in psychology and she didn't go into like, you know, clinical psych or anything. She's used all of her project management skills in that to go through Queensland Health and be doing project management at different levels. So just keeping an open mind and you might need to sell yourself differently because it's, I do miss the days of applying for a science job where it's like you need this technical skill and you meet it. When you're doing those other ones, it's a little bit more challenging at first, but it's just don't underestimate the value of what you've done and what that means. Um, and then I returned to plant pathology and um, plant biosecurity in 2021. I actually got one of those small miracle permanent jobs that do exist out there. Um, and I really love plant biosecurity, so it lets me use that modelling that I've learned, and it's a lot of desktop-based work that I do. So that's what I'll kind of be presenting. My day job <laughs> is supposed to be pest risk assessments, so especially in Western Australia, we don't have a lot of pests that you, we have on the East Coast. So we actually go through and we say, okay, we don't have this pest, how is it most likely to come in? then we actually have to go through a whole lot of steps to say what the risk of it coming on that pathway is. And then if that's above what we call an allowable level of protection, we also look at what other management or policies could be put in place to protect WA agriculture. But about, oh, it must've been about four months into the job, I started in April, I was put onto the polyphagus shot hole for a response. So I'll go through it today, kind of what PSHB is, um, what being a response looks like, as well as what being a subject matter expert looks like in that context. So polyphagus shot hole borer, it was reported through, a, there's like a little symbol here, the My Pest Guide Reporter app, um, which actually will be rolled out in a lot of different states in the coming years. So a lot of states are signing up to it. And it was just a woman in her backyard. You can see these images here. She had some limbs come down in weather. And it's quite phenomenal symptoms. You know, you've got a board all through that tree, weakening a limb, coming down in bad weather. You also get what we call tree noodles. So the beetles don't eat the wood. They just bore in and eat the frass or the wood comes out behind them. Um, and you also get these wet patches around the holes that they make as well. So she had reported on two 30-year-old box elder maple trees in the um, suburb of East Fremantle, and it was the first detection in Australia. And that image at the back is when, when we did detect it and we haven't yet detected it anywhere else, we went in and we actually destroyed that tree to try and reduce the risk of the beetle going anywhere else. So polyphagus shot hole borer, the species name is Uolaceae fornicatus. Um, it's an ambrosia beetle. You might be wondering why a plant pathologist is working on an insect. Um, number one, in government, sometimes you just adapt and you get the work done. But this one actually carries a fungus as well. So it doesn't actually eat the wood. It carries it has specialised little sacs in its mouth and carries the spores with it. So you can't separate one without the other. It's not a systemic fusarium like you might be familiar with. It, that fusarium goes with the beetle, beetle goes with the fusarium. Um, and their ambrosia clay 
fusarian species, which sit in the fusarian Solani species complex. For those of the, who are taxonomists and know how complicated that particular group is. So it excavates those tunnels and you can see a few of the tunnels here with that blackness and you can see the edge of where that fusarium is growing to it as well on a fungal, on the, that's a highly susceptible species there. Um, and it's that dual action of the galleries and then the fungus growing into that space which disrupts water flow and you get tree dieback and in some cases tree death. So where did it come from? I guess, yeah, for the um, biologists in the room, this is always the exciting and interesting part. So they're native to Southeast Asia, so right in the middle, middle here. Um, but, and they, there you get a diversity of both what we call haplotypes of the beetle, as well as the fusarian species. Um, and what we do know is there's three main areas where it's invasive. So you've got Southern California, Israel and South Africa, and they share a common haplotype of the beetle and they share a common fusarium species, Fusarium ulaceae. Um, there is a small little population uh, first actually detected by an Australian researcher who was over there doing macadamia research, but it hasn't really been causing big problems in Hawaii. Um, and it's also got Fusarium ulaceae, but is a haplotype of the beetle that is different to other places. I've just put novel number there simply because it came out after the others came out in terms of numbers. But we're interesting because we've ended up with a different haplotype of the beetle, which could mean that it's come from a different source population to the other location, and a different Fusarium species called AF18, so it's yet to be described. Um, and the interesting thing is we know that that beetle haplotype has been recorded in Taiwan and Vietnam, and that that fusarium species has been detected in Taiwan previously as well. So that's not to say that it's come from Taiwan, because, you know, especially native rangers trying to get enough reach to know exactly how complicated it is across the whole native range, but it gives us an idea that potentially it's come through a different pathway than from those in other invaded areas. Um, and we have some whispers that H38 has been detected since in South Africa, um, or actually not whispers, it is in published literature. And so they think they've had more than one invasion event in South Africa. So that's why, even though we've got one, we don't want any more. And for those who understand, um, you know, species specificity, we could see a different host range on the basis of having a different fusarium species. So life history, this is a really difficult beetle to manage. It spends most of its life in a tree. Why wouldn't you? You know, they're only two millimetres in size, so you're going to stick where you're safe. Um, I find it in, I mean, I know fungal um, biology is incredible anyway, but with these insects, they have what we call a haplodiploid um, mating system. So they only need a single beetle. She doesn't even need to be mated to be able to start a whole population. So she'll usually arrive in the tree, she'll lay the first kind of lot of haploid eggs, which can become male. When those hatch, she will then mate with those, basically her children. Yeah, my sister's face is looking fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> we, have a, we have a great time um, with the public talking about this. Um, and so then she basically can lay eggs that then become females because it's the females that fly. So they're the most important for spreading um, and you get this very female biased sex ratio. So if you do happen to see a PSHB, it's more than likely gonna be a female beetle coming out of the tree. Um, the males will come out every now and then, but they don't move very far. But it has a really short development time for a beetle. So at optimum conditions or so of 24 degrees, 22 days. So, that, you know, and they'll have overlapping generations. So it can just build up numbers very rapidly. It's normally about a month life cycle. And the problem for us in WA is that that means they're likely to just keep reproducing all year round. And we saw that even into the depths of our winter, we were still seeing lots of frost, which was telling us there were active beetles moving around, reinfesting, reinfesting. Um, really high reproductive rate, so you know, from 20 to 50. So you can imagine, again, um, it's like talking about, the good thing is we all understand COVID these days, but those numbers can just exponentially grow up. 
and the females are the ones that fly. And they're only two millimetres long, so they usually won't fly very far. They can, we can't have some data to indicate maybe 400 metres, but usually only 30 to 35 metres. And I don't call them lazy, I think they're smart. They only go to the next best suitable host. They won't go long distances usually. So as I said, they're very, very small. Um, these are great, this is a great image from our colleagues at CSIRO who are, the, who are sequencing the whole genome of Ulaceae cornicatus. Um, and then the males you can see, they're much smaller. So it's about two millimetres or so for female and about 1.6 millimetres for a little male beetle. And he tends to be a little lighter in colour as well. So very small which makes them hard to find, especially if they're up in a tree canopy. Um, and the symptoms that we're looking for are shot holes, which are about one millimetre or so in width, perfectly round. Like you think someone's gone in with a little perfect hammer and done this, but while, you know, these beetles never cease to amaze me. Um, and so we often, when we ask the public to take images, we get them to put a pen or something in the image so we can gauge the size of the shot holes. They form these galleries, which is where they reproduce. You'll get the frass, which is all the wood that they don't, they're not eating it, that needs to just come out of the tree. You'll get gumming in some trees, so that's like a host response to the beetle there. The lesions and staining, which can indicate that the fusarium is growing really actively around that shot hole there. And in some hosts, like avocados and others, you get what we call sugar volcanoes. And so that's, again, similar to the gumming, a response to um, physical kind of damage. And polyphagus, poly, many, phagus eats, you know, it eats a lot of hosts. There's still a lot of, there's still its preferred hosts though. So the current top hosts for us um, are a lot of deciduous exotic trees to, to Australia and WA. So, Excuse me. Uh, you've got your maples, your oaks, your plane trees, your coral trees, your avocados, your robinias or locusts, they're sometimes called. Figs, which we're quite worried about. Um, the figs that it's hitting in WA are uh, east coast species, so we really probably want to keep PSHB contained over to us. And poplars as well. And I'll show you some of the key hosts that we've found as well a bit later on. But literally, you've got hundreds of other susceptible hosts. You know, there's 400 plus taxa that are recorded as being attacked by PSHB. But you know, you've got the chocolate at the top of the fridge and the chocolate is the um, ace in the window or the box elder maple. And these, if they are in the vicinity, these trees will get hit like no other. You can see why it's called shot hold. Like I've literally had my bosses feel like, I think someone's rendered this on a computer program and it's not, they just literally, Sometimes they're almost in perfect little um, grids, um, very good little shot holes. And a box elder maple, if it gets infested by PSHB, typically will only live for two years. So we're talking about a big mature tree being taken out inside two years. It's quite a lot of damage. So I work for the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development. Um, so what are we doing about PSHB? So the first thing to understand is that we work within a national framework, and I'll cover this in a minute. So when something new comes into Australia, everyone needs to be at the table to discuss how to manage it, how important it is. Um, we put in a quarantine area and we restrict movement of risk items in that area. We're doing a lot of trapping and surveillance. Um, we are destroying and managing infested trees. Uh, we work with green waste facilities for those who can <laughs> never thought about where your waste goes. I always think of it as a wicked web of waste, like everything that you put out on your verge has to go. So when we're working with a pest like this, we really have to work closely with local governments to make sure that we're stopping the risk material from moving out, but we still need to let waste move because no one's going to be happy if they still have their waste in their backyard next week, right? So it's, it's a constant battle with that one. And we, with that, we do a lot of trapping around those sites then to help mitigate that risk. Um, and lots and lots of communications and stakeholder engagement. So we have, we put out Facebook marketplace or face, different Facebook ads. We have 
you know, that if you're on gum tree or something, you might put in firewood that an ad will come up to remind you don't move anything that looks like it has shot holes or you're not allowed to move this material out of this area. Um, as well as just all the local governments, all the people who have infested trees and working with them. It's a really big um, lot of work, as well as communicating around us being from plant biosecurity. Some people could easily confuse us with being with general biosecurity for humans in COVID times. So it was really important to have some good comms around that as well. So when an exotic pest like PSHB arrives in Australia, we all kind of adhere to what's called the Emergency Plant Pest Response Plan or the D, where there's a whole lot of um, decisions made between all of the different state actors. And then also if industry is involved, they also come to the table. So pretty much within the first 24 hours of us realising that it's new to Australia. So obviously the labs get the material, they go through it, they, they'll do a full phylogenetic tree and things like that. And they go, this is not being reported in Australia before. So it's between the diagnostic labs as well as talking to plant biosecurity because we have a lot of data as well. Then that gets reported to our boss who then reports it. And for us in WA, that's Dr. Sonia Broughton, who's our Chief Plant Biosecurity Officer. She reports to the Australian Chief Plant Protection Officer, who at the moment is Dr. Gabrielle Vivian-Smith. And then they convene what's called the Consultative Committee on Emergency Plant Pest, so CCEPP, and they're a technical body. So that's made up of all of your chief plant health officers from each state, as well as any um, representative from any affected industry partners. So in our case, you know, because it's trees and street trees, you've got things from nursery and garden through to some of the avocados and things like that that have a, a stake in this pest. Um, occasionally you'll have what's called a scientific advisory panel and for this pest we did have one because we don't know everything. So this included experts from overseas as well as each state who then had a more in-depth look at the literature and fed back to that CCEPP to help them make their decisions. They make a recommendation and within our response at the moment we're looking to be going for a phased eradication response over three years, so quite a long time. Um, and that's now going to go to the, what's called the national management group. So you have the technical and then you have the political and financial. So the NMG is the one who says, yep, let's put the money for this, let's go, and we and they will sign off on the response plan. And that will go through a few iterations until the incident is closed. Either it's eradicated or um, it gets difficult and maybe there, there needs to be some decisions made about transition to management. Um, but that's that's some years away for us at the moment, unless something big happens. So, for example, myrtle rust in Australia, when it first arrived, was a response. And pretty early on, they discovered they couldn't eradicate it. Rusts are very difficult. And they went into what was called um, a transition to management period, just to prepare industry and the public for what's coming ahead. Uh, so where I sit within the response, so we have our Chief Plant Health Officer, Gabrielle Vivian-Smith. You have what's called an incident controller. Um, so I find this interesting because as researchers, we're often used to just doing everything ourselves and just figuring it out and go, go, go. And in a response, you have very clear roles of who does what. So we have public information, who does all of our comms, planning. So as the name suggests, we plan things and then we pretty much and that's where I sit in as a subject matter expert. We then communicate to operations and operations are the people who are out, boots on the ground, looking at trees, doing all of that work. Um, we all work closely with logistics. So if you need anything, and it's actually really nice for it to be that clear, right? You need something in a response and you go, oh, we need, you know, plastic bags for collecting plant material. And you don't go to Bunnings and get it yourself. You let logs know and logs go and find it for you or for our purposes, we're doing a lot of um, work with surveillance and so we need lures and so they, they're the ones who do all of that hard work to get the lures into the country. And then of course, can't go anywhere with that finance and admin. So um, it's in our, the operations is kind of the biggest part of what we do at the moment, um, followed by planning and logistics. And then we've got 
one officer in public information. So he works very, very hard, very good at his job, Marcus Tizzi. And we also have a finance and admin person who kind of comes in and out. So there's sometimes bleed over between roles. The logistics people often will be doing a bit of finance and admin as well. So where, what have we done so far? We've been pretty busy. So this is just to the Perth metro area. That's the outline of the quarantine area. And all of those orange sites are sites that we have visited and inspected trees at. So just in a snapshot, so that quarantine area is covering more than 600 square kilometres, 21 local government areas. And especially when we were talking about green waste, we found it much easier to draw this line on the map around local government areas because each LGA has its own waste streams. So it made it a lot easier to work on that. Um, because sometimes you might say, oh, we only expect the pest to go two kilometres or something like that, and you might draw a circle. But in our, because we knew it would be moving in waste, it was better to set it at LGAs. So far, we've had 243 infested premises. So that could be a premise is someone's backyard, or it could be a whole park. So we've got King's Park, which is quite large, which has a few trees on it as well. Um, and so we hit the crazy number of, we've inspected more than 1 million trees in the last 10 months or so for the response. So that's an incredible amount of work. Um, we, you know, we've taken more than 30,000 samples. We've deployed over 3,000 traps. Um, the teams have, got, have gone more than 300,000 kilometres just to cover what we do. Um, and you'll notice here we've got positive trees, 353. Trees removed is 358. That number is slightly out because we also have some rules around, there are certain trees like the box elder we know will be infested. So if they're found within 50 metres with symptoms, we will take them out as well because we could get the lab result, but realistically it's going to come back positive. So it lets us move quicker um, to try and control that pest. And some species, not all species are equal when they get hit by PSHB. So you've got the chocolate at the top with the box elder, but, you know, you might just get a um, hibiscus plant or something and just have shot holes in it. So you'll only take off the limb of that tree and you won't really see reinfestation. So we approach each species um, on a species by species basis. The quarantine area, basically people can't move risk material out. So we know that if, it, if material that's infested is chipped to 2.5 centimetres and it's to do with the movement of the chipping, kills 99.9% .9 of the beetles. The data is really quite strong. Um, when we treat infested trees, we then take that material additionally to um, be composted so that we're dealing with any residual risk. Because as I said, we only need one beetle to get out. <coughs> um, we also restrict the movement of living plants with woody stems more than two centimetres because there's some literature to show that, you know, that's kind of the smaller size they'll generally go into. Um, and you just need to be keeping material clean and everything. But if people aren't able to meet those requirements, we'd rather people are talking to us. So we say, if you can't meet it and it's low risk material, get in touch with us and we can work on a permit. And a lot of that permit is often an officer going out and looking at it and then moving it. So say you had some really lovely potted ficus in your garden and you're moving from Perth Metro down south, you might have an officer out just to make sure there's no shot holes in that material. So to give you an idea of trapping effort, we're trapping a few places outside of WA, uh, sort of WA, outside of the Perth metro area. And you can see we're really only getting positives within that quarantine area, which is what we want. Even then it's not really extended to the more northerly reaches, which we set it that far out based on some kind of very basic information of how far PSHB is known to spread. Um, so that's been really good. You'll notice between this and it's a food-based lure, the Crucibarol is a really specific lure to ULAC. Um, they actually think the, that lure scent, the Crucibarol, is actually produced by the Fusarium when it's in a host as well which is pretty, and when you think about it, you know, that's their food source. So if they can get to a tree, get the fusarium started and it's going well, that's an attractant 
to other beetles in the area to know that's a suitable host we can move in move in there you know so that's how that law works um, and the host trees are very much in the similar kind of area as our positive um, traps and so what we've got here are ones that are done by morphology so especially the box elder maples we have not seen many many if any other beetles infest them so when we see a beetle that looks like the shb it's probably most likely to be it other hosts actually still have pcr done because what i didn't cover was that uolacea cornicardis up until 2019 was part of a species complex of there's three other beetles in that complex and you can't distinguish them very readily morphologically you need that molecular tool so in a lot of responses you can move to morphological once you've got your system in place but with this one it's just very challenging to do that um, actually the fusarium is one that you can somewhat do morphologically because it doesn't create a classic uh, fusarium spore it actually makes more of a club shaped structure that they think has been evolutionary kind of happened so that the beetle can actually pick up I think of them as little fungal lollipops <laughs> you know they're just going through which makes sense that you've got that convergent kind of thing happening where okay I can pick this up tra travel with them so that's quite cool if you ever um I know there's a few fusarium people in the room and you're excited to look at different fusarium spores uh looking up fusarium you will lazy might make you smile so we can see here you know these are our top areas where we first found it down in east Fremantle, but it wasn't long after that we found it elsewhere and but it's definitely still in more of those leafy riverside suburbs which are areas where you get these mature trees that PSHP prefers. Our top hosts in WA, so we keep a host list updated on the website regularly now. Um, our highest risk hosts are what we call reproductive hosts. So as I said, 400 hosts and only about a quarter of those actually will be able to support reproduction. Um, so for us, our top ones, more than 50% of our positives are box elder maples. And then you come down to coral trees, your rubinias. Um, then we've got a couple of figs in there, the Morton Bay and the Port Jackson fig. And then some of those other bigger trees, exotic trees like your poinciana and your poplar. And less so for the avocados. The good thing is we've not had it show up in any growing regions yet. And even overseas, an avocado in a backyard is often differently managed to an avocado in an orchard. And in an orchard setting, they actually find PSHP is not a very big problem as long as they're keeping their, their trees healthy. But just to give you an idea of what those symptoms look like on the host, you get these beautiful, you're often this dark staining inside the Ace and Agundo galleries. And um, you can actually even just scrape the spores almost immediately out of those if you're looking for it. That amazing shotgun pattern on box elder and then on something like a coral tree you tend to get this really interesting it's more on the ridges that they tend to go in you'll see them almost in lines up a coral tree um, and we suspect that's to do with where maybe just softer material for them to burrow in in the first place uh, poinciana we get more of like a little wet drop and then when the bark comes off you get more of a dry kind of dot happening underneath. We've had some new global hosts, so, and this was only in a highly infested site. So there's some trees that we don't see, because there are umbrella trees all over Perth. And you guys would be very familiar, I hope, with umbrella trees as well. They're, they're all over Queensland. So this was a new global host. Um, so we're watching this one carefully and you're getting that incredible sap flow coming out of the tree in response to injury. The black poplar, which often shows this incredible kind of fungal culture, almost it's like it's growing in that bark of that species. So they're quite incredible. So when when we get a positive tree like that, um, we because it's a stressful experience. If you think we've had people who've got thirty-year-old trees that they planted when their son was born, or when a really big life event happened. Tree, working with trees and tree diseases, you, it changes landscapes, it 
changes property values, all of these things. So when we get a positive tree, we assign a single case manager to that property. So that, that person has a single point of contact with the department to work through them with what's going to happen with that tree. Um, we assess the trees and we make a treatment plan. So as I said, some trees will need to come out. Others may only need to trim off the infected material. We issue what's called a pest control notice. So we already have that quarantine area in play. This adds additional things. So nothing can come off that property because we know it's a higher risk. So we want to manage that risk. And then we do increased surveillance and tracking around that area as well. Because the hard thing with this one is there's not much you can do once you've got an infested tree. Chemicals may be prophylactically to try and protect a high value tree, but you can't use it to necessarily treat or eradicate the beetle from a whole tree. Um, and we even had at least one property where they actually, before we knew it had PSHV, that property owner, because they're often in wealthy areas that can afford it, tented the whole tree kind of did a full gas thing and that tree still didn't survive. So, you know, these are methods that we're able to use for some others just are not working for PSHV. So the best way, as I said, is chipping. So we actually remove the whole tree. With a box elder, you can't even leave the stump. It will keep going. We've even seen, seen it going into, you know, how sometimes you get larger roots coming out. They'll even try larger roots of that species to try and keep going. That's how much they like what fell to maples. So we stump grind down on those species as well. Um, one of our best stories was actually from the US out talking to our colleagues. Disneyland had PSHV and they, they had treated all these trees. They thought they had it under control and they couldn't figure out where all their beetles were coming from. And they had a lovely old stump that people mm -hmm. used to sit on, have their lunch, everything. And they eventually made it there and they, it was just riddled with shot holes and borer. Um, and so eventually they had to take that out. And the cute thing there was because so many people liked sitting on it, they basically made like a little um, stump based kind of, it was some kind of metal poured thing so that it still looked like it was a stump that people could sit on to have their lunch. So they still preserved the, you know, the memory of that tree. So it's a lot of hard work. We do take them out. And with that comes a lot of potential impacts. So these are the things we're trying to avoid. Um, but it's, the biggest impact is in loss of the urban and amenity trees. You can imagine the solar radiation that then comes through. Um, you also, you know, a lot of uh, local governments have big pushes, which are good for biodiversity and getting more trees in to help with keeping places beautiful as well as cooler in a warming environment. Um, fruit and tree crops, there's not a lot of data to show that it has high, high impacts in fruit and tree crops. As I said, when they're well managed, that's the thing with PSHB. If you get a box elder, they'll eat it no matter what's happening to it. Some other trees, it's when they're more stressed and obviously in an urban setting, that'll happen more often. In a good managed orchard, you can be um, kind of fighting off the beetle a little bit better. But as with a lot of these things, you don't know the impact for many, many years. Um, so I worked on myrtle rust back in the early days. We knew we wouldn't see those impacts for 10, 15 years. And I don't even think we knew that we would see as much species loss as we've seen with that particular pest until now. So we're very cautious with this one that we hopefully don't push it to that stage and we want to get that population down and contain and ideally eradicate if we can. So I said I'd talk about that urban interface, just some key examples of the type of work and the sites we've had to manage PSHB. Mm -hmm. Mason Gardens in Delkeith, which is a lovely garden surrounded by million dollar homes. We had more than 150 infested trees at that site. So there were about 30 established box elders. They just kept churning out the numbers. Um, and we have a lot of juvenile trees that we're trying to manage now so that we don't just have an ongoing kind of sump. And that was a lot of work to, as you can see, I'm wearing my earmuffs. We had to work a lot with the residents around, do letter drops to let them know the work was happening. Because so it's going to be two days of like chopping down trees, and um, which is quite disruptive. Um, and we also, so we have what we call Biosecurity Agriculture Management Act officers, BAM officers, who actually 
he's taking a photo to make sure those chips are getting to 2.5 centimetres so that we have a record that we have managed that site properly. We also have sites like Hyde Park. If anyone follows um, Adam Sparks on <laughs> any of his socials, he'll, I know he's been putting up photos of Hyde Park. I don't know if he's put up any with PSHV in them yet. Um, but yeah, a large park in the metro region that we're dealing with there. In. So it's very front of mind for people. And the one that we're really concerned about at the moment is the Perth Zoo. You have a lot of trees in a small area. It's not just the health of people and falling limbs, you're talking about the health of animals and falling limbs. And then what management can you put into place in a complex site like that? So we're working really closely with some complex sites for that. We encourage everyone to report your observations. And even over here, I couldn't help myself in Queen's Park. I could see a whole lot of little tip die back and I kept looking. And I, I, I'm not convinced it's PSHB. You have a related beetle actually over here in Queensland, which is more active on the Sunshine Coast and a little bit around Brisbane area called TSHB, T shot hole borer. Um, but it's not as impactful probably as PSHB. So if you do find symptoms or you know, we always say to people, if they know where a box elder is, they're a great sentinel for us. We want to know where they are so we can track it. Um, and we offer a whole lot of training and information on our website. Now I'm into the, what's your role? Let's bring it back to where we are. No matter where you are in the country, you always have a role to play in biosecurity. We were really lucky that that person from the public went, this looks really weird and I'm going to report it, right? Because we know from that timeline that it's probably been there for at least two years. And it took her until that point to be like, this just isn't looking like anything I've seen before. So for us on our side, my boss, Sonia, needs to report to Gabrielle, the Chief Plant Protection Officer, within 24 hours whenever we think it's something new to Australia. And we are encouraged to report both new pests as well as host and range extensions. And that's where, if you, especially the work that you do, if you all of a sudden see something on a weird host, especially if you have impacts for industry, let us know because then we can start to shift our policies at a government level to make sure growers are protected. Um, because those new pests can impact exports and market access as well. Um, just reminding you to report before publishing. Um, lodging specimens as well as a good way um, to keep things current. And if you're not sure if it has been reported in the state before or in Australia before, reach out to your local department of ag. We have a lot of, you know, what I call grey literature that others just don't have access to. Um, we have within our team, say WA, we have an incredible database where over time, because we do a lot of searching for different things, we've kept kind of cliff notes on every species we've had to deal with. Um, and sometimes you might know more than we do as well. So if you think you do, we still don't mind being told that we don't know something as well because we're working across so many pests and diseases. Um, and a reminder as well that there is the Plant Health Australia bulk training you can take as well, which just goes over what, your, what the responsibilities are and how it all works in together. Um, for myself, this is my last slide. I have no idea how I'm doing for time. Um, working a response as a subject matter expert, I mean, the easiest way to say it is it's exhausting, but it's also exhilarating. <laughs> um, you know, it's super fast paced and interesting. You have to give technical advice in context. So sometimes, you know, we're so used to having so much time to I want to look at every detail and tell you the best I can. You make the best decision you can at the time, and then you circle back around if you discover it's not quite right. Because that's okay, as long as you're making the best decision you can at the time to manage it. Um, we do a lot of recording. So, you know, I share my role with um, Louise Cressa, and so it's important that we have standard operating procedures and work instructions to share amongst us, and that you keep track of co key conversations and decisions that are made as well so that um, you're covered in that regard. And as I said, that the structure provides support. I thought it's so nice to be like, I need this. I can just go to logs and say, can you please do this? I also have to be okay with not being in the field all the time and saying, okay, can the ops people go out and survey this? 
And the other thing you start to appreciate, those surveillance staff end up having way better eyes for it than I do. Um, and so, you know, you hand off tasks to who is the best person to do it. And so, yeah, from my point of view, thanks to everyone, especially the response team who are just incredible, um, including the incident controller for a lot of it, David Cousins, um, the public information manager, Marcus, who's put together a lot of these slides. So when I say sharing the load, it's like, Marcus, I need a, some slides for this or that, and he'll pull them together, which is incredible. Um, my fellow SME, Louise, um, as well as, you know, the diagnostics lab are just run off their feet. We've had a very busy year in WA. Um, amongst all of this, I've also been SME on Myrtle Rust as well as Blueberry Rust by coming to the state. So it's, we're getting hit from all sides at all times. So it's been really good and the teams have been great for that and everyone working with us. That's me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlie. Thank you for coming down the range to deliver this.